everyone, my name is Muon and today I'm going to be showing you how you can start learning how to crochet. This video is going to be for absolute beginners and I'm going to do my best to be as detailed and thorough as possible so that by the end of this you have enough knowledge to feel like you can absolutely do this yourself. I'm going to start off by talking about supplies and materials. So when we crochet, generally we use one hook as opposed to the two needles that are used for knitting. And now that you are aware of this pivotal difference, if you were not previously, feel free to correct people to your heart's content. Okay, so generally the most common differences between hooks that you'll see are in terms of size. So size is marked most often in millimeters and then in terms of material so both of my hook sets here are made from aluminum but there are also plastic hooks which are i think generally made from acrylic but i don't know what all the types of plastic are um, and then also there are wooden hooks I believe, or at least in my experience, the difference between these top three or these three most common hook materials is in how smooth versus how much friction they have. So when I'm working with the hook, basically I'm going to be making a whole bunch of knots, right? And so the yarn is going to slide off of the hook or need to slide off of the hook, but there are also going to be times when I'm gripping. So. When I use a hook that is smoother, I'm going to be able to move faster because there is less friction, therefore the yarn just swoop, slips off, right? But sometimes, especially if you're a beginner, it can be a little hard to control everything because you don't have as much of a grip with your tool itself. So that's where wooden hooks come in. They generally have a lot more friction, so it's not always going to be as quick, as smooth as a metal or even a plastic hook, but it's going to give you that control that you might really want or really need as a beginner. Personally, I prefer aluminum because they're the most readily available, and I just like that smooth swoop, slip off. So when I first started out, I bought this pack of crochet hooks from Amazon. It was super cheap. I bought them because they were cheap and because I'm cheap. And they actually work pretty well. As you can see, after many years, probably like four or five years, they're still intact. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for my body. Uh, after maybe two years of constantly crocheting, I mean non-stop, daily for hours on end, I developed tennis elbow in both of my forearms, I guess. And so I decided to make the switch from these hooks to the more ergonomic hooks. So you can see they're both made from aluminum, but the difference is that their handles are rubber and have a greater circumference. And supposedly this is just better for your hand to hold something that's larger. Also, I think there is supposedly a benefit to working with a hook that is not freezing cold. So because the entire aluminum hook here is just metal, when you pop it out of the bag first thing when you decide to start working for the day it can be cold and i think that's supposed to be bad for your hand or whatever so i much prefer these ergonomic hooks they're not perfect they don't totally eliminate all chances of having pain but better than nothing plus even though they were slightly more expensive they did come with this bag and they also came with, let's see, they came with some tapestry needles and they have this oh, cutting thing and also stitch markers, which I will talk about in a moment. So feel free to buy either one. Um, if you're thinking that you are not really ready to invest in crocheting you just want to try it as a one and done you saw a cute hat and you're thinking 
that's all I want. Never gonna crochet again after this. Feel free to just buy this really affordable pack. If you're thinking about maybe crocheting as a passion, carrying it on into the future, or if you just plan on doing it for a long time, I do recommend investing in an ergonomic set. Other things you might need include something that can cut. This is my favorite pair of scissors. I got it from my grandma. It's a giant pair of sewing scissors. I like it because it's ginormous, bigger than my hand. You don't need scissors from your grandma. You just need things that can do the snippy snip. These are technically not mandatory. They're not necessary, but I highly suggest that you buy some tapestry needles. These are going to be used at the end of your work, basically when you've finished, to sew in all of the excess yarn that you have sticking out everywhere. The difference between tapestry needles and uh, regular sewing needles is that when you stab yourself, it does hurt, but it doesn't puncture your skin. And that helps for a variety of reasons. Uh, yarn projects can be more tense, so you sort of pull the yarn out with as much force as you can and then you know you end up taking out someone's eye so sometimes it's better to have a less stabby point and also the eye is just bigger the needle itself is bigger which is more effective or just more helpful when you're using a bigger yarn or a bigger thread and then finally this is a bag of stitch markers they look like little safety pins and you just clip them on to whatever part or point of your piece. They're used to help you keep track of how many stitches you've made, what row you're in, all that sort of thing. If you didn't know already, crocheting actually involves quite a bit of counting and if you decide to design your own projects, it involves math. If you don't love math, I actually don't love math either, um, but I do it anyway because I like to crochet. But if you don't like math, just, I don't know, follow one of my tutorials instead so you don't have to think about that kind of thing. But generally, uh, you can use these stitch markers. You can I use little pieces of yarn that you've cut and sort of hook it into the stitch. Or you can use real safety pins if you're not afraid of being stabbed. So whatever floats your boat, you could use absolutely nothing. Just make sure that you are counting or at least very cognizant of where you are so that you don't lose track of what stitch you're supposed to do or where you are in your project. I realized that was kind of redundant, but nonetheless. All right, now we're gonna talk about the stars of the show, which is yarn. There's a lot of variation in yarn. Uh, whether that be in terms of color or terms of weight. So weight is just the thickness of yarn. This is a weight four yarn. This is also a weight four yarn. This is a weight two yarn. As you can see, the weight two yarn is around half the thickness of the weight four yarn. Thinner yarns take longer to work, but they can be used for more detailed projects. Uh, larger yarns take way less time to work, so you could be making the same, I don't know, 12 inch square with fine yarn, and that's gonna take you significantly more time than a giant, uh, chunky yarn. But I find that even though larger yarns are faster to work with, unless you're making something humongous, sometimes it does lose that fine detail that you can achieve with thinner yarns. The difference in textures is something that you'll find as well. This is a soft, very soft fleece yarn. This is um, sort of like a sticky, fuzzy yarn. Um, and this is a bit scratchy. So there's a bunch of different textures and that goes in hand, hand in hand with what materials they're made of. So this is fleece. This is 
I have absolutely no idea because I got this for free from a friend aunt and this is acrylic. Acrylic is the most common yarn, at least that I've seen, and it's generally the most affordable type. And then also different yarn types wash differently and they also can be slightly different in size. I mean, generally, again, as I mentioned, yarn sizes are standardized, but they're depending on the type of material that they're made from, there can be tiny variations in how thick the yarn actually is. Now that we've chosen what type of hook that we like to use the most and what type of yarn that we prefer, how do we choose what size hook to use with what size yarn? Your safest bet is going to be to match the size of the hook with the weight of the yarn. So this is a four millimeter hook and a weight for yarn. Four, 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 four. But you can get a little complicated, a little fancy if that's what you like. So let's say I want to use a bigger hook or a four and a half millimeter hook or even a nine millimeter hook. You're just gonna have a different experience. You can use any size hook technically with any size yarn, just what you're going to experience is gonna be different. I feel like I kind of repeated myself there. Please bear with me. So when you have a bigger hook compared to the size of your yarn or the weight of your yarn, you're essentially going to be creating bigger knots. So what you'll end up with is a fabric that is stretchier, airier, that has more space so maybe something that you would use for a summer top because you want you want to feel the wind on your skin right and then if you have a smaller hook for example a 2.5 millimeter hook you're going to be making tighter knots so it's going to be a little neater a little cleaner you're going to see a lot less space if you hold it up to a light for example there's going to be less light shining through onto your face but in that way typically when you use a larger hook you use less yarn than if you are using a smaller hook to create the same you know area of fabric because you are making really dense stitches as opposed to really large airy stitches that you know, are mostly air, uh, more air than they are actual yarn. Anyways, so I do think that there is kind of a limit, an unspoken limit in terms of the sizes that you do use. I mean, again, do whatever you want, you know, live your life, you got free will. But if I use a gigantic hook, a hook that is super huge compared to a yarn that is, you know, small, um, relatively smaller I am gonna have some difficulty working it I'm going to just have so much space that it can be hard to control what you're doing and then if I use a small hook a teeny tiny in comparison hook when I'm grabbing the yarn sometimes instead of grabbing the entire piece what people or what I, even I often end up doing is I will be splitting or stabbing you know the yarn and not getting the entire piece just a bit of the piece and then you kind of get a mess of knots and loops everywhere so again the safest bet is the 4-4 four, four method match the weight to the size or go 0.5 to 1 millimeter up or down. Now I'm going to answer a question that most people probably don't even have going into crocheting but I'm going to answer it in the spirit of being thorough and wanting to save you some time in the future. So how do you actually access or unwind your yarn? So when you have a skein, which is like this oblong type of yarn as opposed to a ball, right? There is going to be this bit of yarn that comes out from the center of the skein. And that is called, actually I don't know what it's called, but what we use it for is center pulling because it comes out from the center. And what we're gonna do is just pull the yarn out 
from the center. Center. And that is super satisfying to do. Keeps everything in place. You know, we don't have all that wiggling around. But as I learned the hard way, once you near the end of the skein, you end up with this giant tangled up ball, this mess that you have to untie and untangle and it takes forever. And after the first time I ever did a project and I center pulled, I never did it again. I never center pulled again. <laughs> Instead, I just take this, you know, the wild part that comes out when you first open your skein, right? And I just unwind. And this can get a bit annoying sometimes because it goes all over the place, but if you've seen yarn bowls, that's what that's for. Maybe you can use this as an excuse to buy one. Uh, but generally, it's not too annoying. You can kind of just put it in a yarn, uh, in a basket, like a laundry basket, you know, put it on your lap or something. Not a big deal. Um, but either way, you're going to be able to knit or crochet, so whatever floats your boat, whichever you prefer. Moving on to the slip knot. When you crochet any project, you are always going to start with some sort of knot. The most basic of these knots is the slip knot, so that's the one I'm going to be showing you right now. Oh, that's just that's just a piece. Okay. So I'm going to just quickly show you what a slip knot is first, and then I'm going to slowly take you through the process. Okay, so this is a slip knot, and it's so called because you can take your hook, put it in there, and then you pull on one of the sides, and it just closes, just like that, right? And then you can adjust it and make it big again, slip, 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 and then it's small again, right? So I'm just going to slowly show you how to do it yourself. So you're going to take your non-dominant hand, lefties, I'm sorry, I'm right-handed. Maybe flip the video or something, I'm sorry. But for my righties out there and my camera flipped lefties, I'm going to take your two fingers, right? Your index and your thumb, and you're going to grab the tail end. This is what I call the tail end because it sort of wiggles around and then this side that's not really an end but you know it's the other end that's connected to the ball I just call the ball end right so we're gonna take the tail end and our two crappy fingers and we're gonna just drape it away from us over our fingers and it's gonna make a U shape sort of like an N an upside down U okay, so after that we're going to sort of take the tail and make an X over the ball end of the yarn, right? You don't have to lay it on your hand like this, I just want to make it clear for you to be able to see what I'm doing. And also, I guess in the beginning when you start, it's good to have everything flat. So you want to make a clear X. I'm going to show you one more time. Drape the tail over your pinched crab fingers. Now pick up the tail, and I can turn your hand and throw that tail over the ball yarn so that you have this X. And what you want to make sure that you do is have the tail as the over yarn. Not the yarn that's under in the X, but the one that's on top. Right? And now I'm just going to grab both of these ends, keep that X shape with my other hand, Maybe you can use your two crabby fingers and then I'm holding it with my uh, middle and my ring finger, but you know, do whatever feels most comfortable to you. You just want to have this X, almost like an hourglass now. And then with my two crabby fingers in my non-dominant hand, I'm going to grab, go over and grab the tail, uh, sorry, to grab the ball yarn with these two fingers and pull them through the loop. Right? And then you're going to pull the tail yarn tight, 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 tight until it makes this knot. I'm going to show you again. All right. We made our drape on our crabby fingers. Then we made our X. We're holding it however is comfortable now that it's in this hourglass shape. 
two crabby fingers, go over and grab the ball end of the yarn, pull it through so that we have this little loopy thing, pull it through this loop, and then with the tail yarn, we're just gonna pull, 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 pull until it's tight, and then we should have this one loop, right? This one loop and two legs. So the reason why we want the tail yarn to be on top is because we're going to be pulling through or pulling through the loop whichever thread or yarn is on the bottom. And whichever yarn is on the bottom is the one that the knot is going to move along, right? And when I say that, I mean that if I pull the uh, ball yarn, the knot moves along that side to shrink or expand the yarn. So technically you could do it the other way around. You could grab the tail, you could put the tail on the bottom, but since I like to be able to use as much as my, of my yarn as possible, I prefer to do it this way so that when I pull, the excess yarn goes back to the ball end and not to the tail end to be eventually cut off. So now what we do is we take our hook and we put it right into the middle of the loop. And then we take our ball end of the yarn and we're gonna just pull, 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 pull until it's tight. Now we don't want it to be super tight, as in choking the, choking the hook tight. Imagine that you're wearing a scarf, right? If you have it too tight, you're gonna be suffocating. It's not gonna be fun, not gonna be comfortable. If it's too loose, it's gonna be really hard to work with. Uh, again, with the scarf analogy, it's gonna be flopping all over the place, you're gonna be cold. So what we want is to have it sort of kinda tight, but with a little space, right? A little space so that you can move. So you can turn your neck in the scarf without uh, being afraid that you're gonna get rug burn or something, but also the scarf is not just gonna fly off your neck. All right, so now you have your slip knot set up. Next, we're going to move on to tension. How do we set up our hand to begin? This part can be a little difficult um, when you're first starting out, so I'm just gonna show you a bunch of times, play back the video at a slower slower speed or something, whatever works for you. So you take your non-dominant hand and you're just going to open all your fingers like this. Now I'm going to take the yarn and I'm going to go clockwise over my pinky and then up, but still clockwise, right? So we're just going to make this loop around our pinky clockwise. And then from here, we take the yarn and go behind our three fingers, turn our hand again, and then I use my thumb and my middle finger to hold onto the base of whatever stitch I'm working in. In this case, that would be the slip knot. I'll just hold on to it. I'll show you one more time. And before I show you again, I just want to let you know that it's best to set up your hand kind of close to where you're going to be working. If I do it all the way over here, I can't even reach my hook, right, when I'm working. So we're going to do it kind of like, I don't know, maybe two inches or inch and a half uh, away from the hook. Whatever you find is the most comfortable for you. Also, don't, don't work the tail end. The tail end we're basically going to ignore until the end. Okay, so again, we go over, train over the pinky clockwise, we come up, we go behind the three fingers, we turn it, turn the hand again, and then grab with our thumb and our middle finger right at the base of the stitch. One more time. Over the pinky clockwise, under, and up. And we're gonna go behind the three fingers, we're going to turn and then hold the base of our stitch with these two fingers, the thumb and the middle finger. 
So when we have this tension here, uh, this is what we talk about uh, when we're mentioning tension. We don't want to have tension that is too loose, and that just basically means that you're holding the yarn really loose. There's a lot of space uh, here. There's a lot of yarn between you and the hook, right? Because that's just going to make really loose stitches. It's going to be hard to control. Um, and you don't want it to be too tight because then your stitches are going to be too tight. You're going to be tense the entire time. And that generally leads to pain. Uh, as a rule, I try to be more loose than, uh, than tense because I have a lot of pains. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm going to recommend to you. It's better to err on the side of being loose, being gentle. Um, and then also, what happens when we are creating the tension or creating our tension and setting up our hand is that we're basically going to be pulling the yarn along our hand as we work and the tension kind of keeps everything in place, keeps um, the yarn taut so that we can actually work it while we're pulling along, right? So here we go with our tension and you're set up to start. Now that we're set up here, we're going to make our chain. Chain serves as a foundation for our piece. Um, it's not necessary for every piece and it can even be replaced in the instances where it is often used, but I find that it's the easiest way to start. Okay, so we're gonna hold, hold the base with our hand and we're gonna take our hook and turn clockwise grab the hook I mean grab the yarn with our hook and pull it through the loop of the slip knot. Right, and we're gonna have this little V. I'll show you one more time. No, I'll, show you, I'll, I'll show you several more times. So we're gonna turn the hook clockwise, grab the yarn with our hook, pull through the loop. Clockwise pull through the loop. Clockwise, pull through the loop. When you pull through the loop, you create another loop on your hook, right? And that's the next one that you're going to be going through. So, in order to make each of our stitches identical, if that's what our goal is, um, generally it is, but, you know, if you want to be different or you want to try something new, go for that. Uh, do whatever makes you happy. But if you want them to be neat, and identical, the rule or the key is consistency, consistent tension. So you want to keep the tension in your hand or the tension in this space or the amount of yarn we have in this space consistent, 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 consistent. However loose, however tight you're doing it, as long as you're consistent, you're going to have identical stitches. So I'm just going to make, let's see, maybe eight. Two, four, six, seven, eight stitches or chain stitches. You can make however many you want. Um, just keep in mind that sometimes the size that we have when we chain is not necessarily going to be reflective of the size of the final product. You're probably going to have to you know, test different stitches with different yarns, different tensions, but for the most part, you can chain however many you want. The single crochet is the most common and the most foundational stitch that we use in crocheting. I think in, in the UK, the single crochet is actually called the double crochet or something, and then they use treble for double crochet. Basically, the UK terminology is different. You just gotta know that the, uh, if you're following a tutorial, it'll be kind of easy to tell what they're referring to. But just just for um, reference in the future, so that you don't get confused or you know taken aback. So when we do a single crochet, we can decide first of all where into the chain we want to insert our hook. So on the front end, we have these V's. And on the back end, we have these, this spine that runs along with two sides, right? 
I don't know if you can see it, but yes, so there's the spine. So generally, what people do is they go under both of these loops of the V, they go under the V, and that's how they make their first stitch for their foundation. But what I like to do is instead of going into one loop or one loop or two loops, I turn that bad boy over, right? I turn it towards me and I go into the spine, into the spine stitches so that on the bottom I can have this nice clean V look, almost like a knitted appearance, right? That's just a preference. You know, you can do what you want. So if I were to go under the V, what I would be doing is I would insert my hook into one of the loops and then I would insert my hook uh, when one of the loops and I would insert my hook into the second loop which is clearly difficult for me because I'm not used to this all right there we go I did it I did it and so can you all right so you would put your hook under both loops and then essentially that would just be the entire beat all right you can do it that way or you can do it into one of the loops or you can do it into the other loop. Uh, this is actually not the most common. You can do it into the other loop. Or, as I prefer to do it, and how I'm going to be doing it in this video, is you turn it over towards you, and you find that little spine. And when we crochet, single crochet, we actually skip the first chain, right? Because that technically is helping us turn. It's the turning chain, right? It's almost like the hinge that you would have on a door. So you don't walk through the hinge, you walk through the door or the doorway, right? So I'm going to take my hook and I'm going to put it through and under this spinal bump. And I'm going to have two loops on my hook, right? Now when we single crochet, we're going to take our hook and we're going to go clockwise, grab our yarn, pull through the first loop, that would be the spine. We're gonna have two loops on our hook and you want them to be around the same height so that the stitch you make is even. If you pull really tight and have really tight tension, that hole is going to be super tight and you're not gonna be able to pull your hook through it as readily. Um, I know I just contradicted myself by doing that really tight, but I was not making my tension that tight because again, <laughs> I have tennis elbow. But now we have two loops that are even in height and we're gonna Again, yarn, this is what it's called, yarn over, or yarning over. We're gonna yarn over clockwise, grab our yarn, pull through both of the loops. And you have your first, your first single crochet. I'm so proud. Right? Now we're gonna do that again. So we're gonna put our hook into the spine bump. Yarn over clockwise. This is clockwise. Pull through, pull up a loop of an even height, pull through two. Go through the spine, turn over, pull up a loop, pull through two. Go, Go through the spine, yarn over clockwise, pull through, pull up a loop, pull through two. Stab into the spine, and over, and then pull through. And as you can see, I'm holding the yarn or the piece itself with my two fingers that I was previously holding the base of the slip knot with. I like to do it this way just so I can have a hold um, of where I'm trying to put my hook into, just for control purposes. I don't know if people do it in different ways, but whatever again whatever's comfortable to you uh, I personally just like to put it at the base of whichever stitch I'm working next so again clockwise pull through pull through two and then we're gonna get to the end and do this last one and you'll have your first row so because we did our hinge we skipped our hinge we actually have the uh, Total number of chains minus one stitches. So I did eight chains, so I have seven stitches. 
you just want to count back if especially if you're new but also even if you're not new to just make sure that you got every single uh stitch done all right so now that we have our first row we're going to chain one and then we turn our work away from us right? away now in some cases people actually count the first chain that we did uh, the turning chain as a stitch in itself and they'll skip this first single crochet that we have from the hook right i don't like to do that because i find that the density of one chain isn't equal to that of one single crochet so i actually just work into the single crochet instead of counting the chain as a single crochet and skipping this first one and then going into the second one again matter of preference i just find that it's cleaner um and it just makes things look a little neater so when we actually start our row there's many different areas that we could go into we could go into this part of the v the v uh, the part that's closest to us the loop that's further away from us we could go into both i'm actually going to show you all of the options and you can choose whichever you like for whatever style you want but typically what we do is we go under both loops we stab you see each of these little stitches has a bit of a space in between them right i don't know if you can see the space but there is a space i promise you so there's a space and we're going to take our hook actually it's very pronounced here you can see that we're going to pick our hook and we're going to stab it into that space and it's going to go under both loops of the v right and then we're going to yarn over pull through pull up a loop pull through two and then we're going to keep doing that until the end And we're gonna do that. Again, we're gonna chain one at the end, turn our work away from us, stab under both loops so that we are under the V, and then single crochet. one more and then I'm going to show you that there is actually a difference that is created when you yarn over clockwise versus counterclockwise so generally what I've been showing you is my preferred method which is to go clockwise over and then pull through right and this is because it creates sort of an X type of stitch and this X is great for amigurumi because it sort of eliminates the space or the gaps between stitches. But if we, let's say, go through or under and we yarn in clockwise, in the clockwise direction, so we would go clockwise over, grab, pull through, in, clockwise over, pull through. I'm just gonna do it to the end so you can see or, I don't know, so I can better explain the difference. It's a bit hard to see, even with significantly, even, even a little bit better of lighting than I have right now. But what happens is when we yarn clockwise versus counterclockwise, or when we yarn over counterclockwise, we create a V as opposed to an X, right? And the V is going to have space on both sides here, which means that Again, if you hold up your piece to the light, you'll see those spaces a little more uh, pronounced or more readily, which is why when you do amigurumi, which is making plushies, a lot of people prefer to go clockwise because they want their stitches to be as close together as possible, have as little spaces as possible so that you don't see like the stuffing coming out of your work. Okay. So now that we have this, I'm going to show you what happens when you go into the front loop or the back loop. So this is a piece where I did front loop only crochet. And I'm going to actually show you how to do that before I explain the difference in the texture or whatever. So 
we chained one to turn and when we front loop only we're actually working in this these stitches the stitches that are closest to us this is the front and this other part of the v these back stitches are the back loop front loop back loop okay so we're going to actually to work the front loop only step under up and through the v so that you have one loop the front loop only right we yarn over pull through we're gonna stab from underneath instead of going through we're gonna stab underneath go up and through the v yarn over pull through up through the v yarn over pull through up through the v yarn over pull through and so the difference here is actually pretty evident when we do the regular crochet single crochet stitch we create these sets of two or these couplets right and there is actually a trench or dent that goes between each pair of two when we do front loop only crochet each pair of two is separated not by a trench, but by this line, right? Now what happens when we do back loop only crochet? Okay, so I have this piece here, and again, I'm gonna show you how to do it before I explain the difference. So unlike the front loop only when we stabbed up, we're going to go from the top of the V, stab through and down, down yarn over and pull through, right? We're gonna go through, down, yarn over, pull through, down, yarn over, pull through, down, down, and then down one more time. Okay. So again, the, there is a very visible difference, right? The back loop only creates what we call a ribbing effect, which is, you know, if you have cuffs that are stretchy on your clothes, that's ribbing, right? So as I just said, it's, it's a stretchier type of uh, pattern or style, right? And also it has this like crinkle cut potato chip texture. It's like makes a Z or a zigzag along the side, whereas these two, like from the side, they're pretty flat, right? And instead of these couplets, they're kind of divided every, I don't know, maybe one and a half or like every third as opposed to every second row. And we have this trench, but we also have this very pronounced middle section for each uh, like division or row section. Not row. Uh, rows are singles, but basically these little groups are divided by trenches, but they are cut in the middle by this raised spine. And that's the difference between the three. Now that we're done with whatever we were making, I don't know, a, a square pot holder, a rectangular coaster, a, a scarf, a blanket, we have to know how to finish off what we've done. So I'm gonna get my scissor and I generally recommend two and a half to three inches of length when you cut your yarn. In centimeters, that's probably like double, so uh, five to eight centimeters maybe. I'm just gonna cut it shorter though because this is a sample for me to show you what to do and I feel like it would be a waste if I had a really long tail just for this tiny bit. Okay, so what we do is now we're gonna take this loop we're just gonna pull, 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 and that thread is gonna come through. And now we have these two threads um, two that are pretty much uh, secure, right? I can shake this all I want. It's really not gonna come out. Now, if I were to cut right here, at the very base, that's a different story because we've essentially gotten rid of all this length and left a tiny, tiny nub, and that tiny nub is shorter than this loop and the loop is gonna come off and then things are gonna start coming undone, which is you know, pretty tragic in my opinion. 
from me and if you spend so much time in a Okay, so what do we do instead? You could make a knot, like a, one of these knots, right? And you pull, pull through and you're gonna like, pull through, right? I don't wanna untie the knot, but you get what I mean. Yes, you could make a knot. In the beginning, I was lazy, so I made knots. It was, it was quick, I made a knot, I cut, right? But the thing is, knots quickly come undone. You wash it a couple times, you bat it around a couple times, your dog chews on it a couple times, bam, it comes out. And that's because when you cut it, you've left that little nub again, and there's very little surface area, meaning that there's very little friction uh, to keep everything in place. So what do we do instead if we don't want our things to fall apart after we've made them? We take our tapestry needle, and we put the yarn through the eye of the needle. And then what we do is we just weave in the end. We're just sewing it throughout the body of the piece. We go, I don't know, up and down works, side to side works, any direction all over the place works. What we don't want to do is just go straight because we can just pull, 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 pull that right out, right? And weaving in works better because we are using this entire length, which has more surface area, to create more contact and therefore more friction makes it harder to just pull things out. Now, do I know science? Not really. But does that sound signed en sound enough to me? It does. <laughs> so if it doesn't sound sound to you, at least just take my word for it that for some reason, maybe magic, it works that way. Okay, so what we do is we just go through our piece and so basically wherever we want to if you have a hole somewhere that's huge and you don't like it sometimes i just like to put the yarn through and kind of hide it and pretend that there was never a mistake or anything like that which would be great if i could do that with the rest of my life but alas we must learn from our mistakes and embrace them and yada 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 but Anyways, so we weave through, and I'm not gonna do the whole thing just because um, this video is already long enough. But what you would ideally do is go for as long as you can before you're stopped by the length of the yarn and the length of the needle, and then you just take your scissor or your cutty thing and you snip. And then if you have this little bit remaining, you kind of just beat it up a little, you know, shake it around, and then it'll hide and you probably won't see it again. Right, then I'm gonna just do that quickly for the other side so you can get the whole picture. Again, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna to abbreviate with it so that you're not stuck here for too much longer. But again, remember that you wanna go in many different directions, or at least, you know, one, two, three, four passes, right? You wanna just go in one, two, one. Don't follow the example that I just said by doing only two stitches, but here we go. Now we have our final little piece, or maybe gigantic piece, and you officially know how to crochet, so. Good job. What I like to do, okay, this is a bit of extra information. You don't have to stay for this part, but you know, uh, if you want a little bit of extra wisdom, you know. What I like to do with my ends, if they're not super long, if they're long, like at, at this long, so that's about 12 inches, right? Or 32 centimeters approximately, then I save it for details or sewing later on. But what I do with this really short yarn is sometimes I'll double it up. It's kind of awkward because they're not the same length here. And I'll just cut, 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 and I'll cut it into this little fine fuzz. Be careful not to chop your fingers because I've almost done that multiple times. And after you cut it into this fuzz, you can use this as stuffing. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with the a last bit of wisdom or a last bit of advice, or maybe this is kind of me begging you to please, 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 please remember to take breaks when you're working. I know a lot of people don't talk about this enough, uh, but after going through the experience that I've gone through, that I'm still going through, it feels kind of unwise or unauthentic to me to not warn you all or to advise you all to take breaks, get up, move around, shake your hands, you know, put your stuff down and do something else, move your body, 
because we don't want to have pain, you know? We don't want pain in our hands, our wrists. You see, I just had a crack because my hands are stiff. But our, our fingers, our forearms, elbows, our shoulders, our necks, back pain, right? That stuff makes life hard. It makes creating hard and painful. And honestly, life is painful already. So please take care of your body, take care of yourself, you know, do stretches, do exercises. I recommend taking a break at least every one hour, right? You don't have to stretch, you don't have to exercise. If you don't want to do either of those things, please just at least take breaks and I don't know go drink some water or something right we want to make sure that we are able to make things for as long as we can or as long as possible as long as our hearts still want to uh, I'm not a medical professional I do have a routine of stretches and exercises that I do that help me relieve my tennis elbow so if you want to see that let me know in the comments um, but if not, you can follow physical therapists, uh, YouTube videos, th their tutorials. You can, you know, get an actual physical therapist. You can look things up online. There's a whole bunch of exercises and stretches and all sorts of advice online that you can find. Whatever works for you, just please, please take breaks. Please take care of yourself. All right, with that, I think I'm going to finally wrap up this probably super long video. I hope that you were able to get something out of this and that you were not bored to death by my neurodivergent tangents and rambling. I've been Juan and I'll be wishing you all the happiness in the world. Have a good day!